How's it going? I'm Jared Gillis. Welcome to another All About RVs. Today we're talking about RV electrical and having a good base understanding of how the RV electrical system works. Oftentimes we'll, we'll dive into looking at inverters or a solar setup or a generator for your RV or different types of batteries, but uh, being able to have an understanding of how the whole system works together can help us understand those different elements that are involved when we dive in deeper into them. So today we're gonna try and help you understand the basics of the, the RV electrical system, because it can get pretty confusing. We basically have two main systems. We have uh, the AC side, the 120 volt, and then we also have the, the 12 volt DC side, and then we have devices that kind of help us blur the lines so we can get a lot of functionality and flexibility out of our RVs. So let's start off by looking at the AC side. So that's gonna be devices like a microwave, your, your typical outlet, the AC in the RV, a typical TV, uh, electric fireplace inside of the RV, a water heater on electric setting, fridge on the electric setting, and our first line blurring device between AC and DC is the converter. That's all powered by the AC side of the the RV, when we plug in our RV to shore power. Now, commonly you see the two different types of RVs. You see the, the 30 amp RV and then you see the 50 amp RV. So uh, we've gone over this in other videos, but the 30 amp RV is just 30 amps. You, you open up that shore power pedestal where you can plug in and you see the plug for 30 amps or just one breaker there. And on the 50 amp side, you'll see two breakers tied together. So on the 30 amp side, if we were to look at that plug, we see that we have the, the ground in the center and then we have the, the hot leg and the neutral. And that's how the, the AC power is delivered into our RV. Uh, that has a safety ground on there and then the hot leg and the neutral is what provides the power so that we can uh, power all those devices that we talked about on the AC side. So understanding that in 30 amps is really simple. Now on the 50 amps, we still have our, our safety ground. We have line one, line two, and then we have our neutral in the middle. Uh, if you were to test this, uh, I have a diagram that we have on the website so you can test to the, the pedestal if you wanted to. Uh, if you go between line one and neutral, we get 120 volts. If you go between line two and neutral, you get 120 volts. And if you test between line one and line two, you see that we have 240 volts. That's because it's a split phase system. This isn't single phase, it's split phase. And that's what gives us the ability to have basically 100 amps of power for these 50 amps RV. It's 50 amps per side. And that's why when you look at a 50 amp breaker box in an RV, you see that uh, the, the 50 amp breakers are usually in the middle and then you have line one on one side and line two on the other side. And they try and balance those panels so that as you use things on, on one side of the panel, it balances out the other side. And that's because of the taking advantage of the split phase setup. Now to look at the source of what we're plugging into, we don't always have the option of plugging in our 50 amp RV into a 50 amp pedestal every time or a 30 into a 30 amp. So that's where uh, being able to use a dog bone, have these adapters to be able to adapt down to your RV is very help helpful. It gives you a lot of flexibility. So you can get an adapter uh, to be able to plug in your 50 amp RV into a 30 amp pedestal or the 30 into a 50 or uh, it just gives you a lot of flexibility as far as the Source. So that's usually the most common way to get power to your RV is when you're plugging into a, a pedestal or plugging in at your house. But you could also use a generator. Generator will give you AC power to your RV. So you can either have a portable one. Uh, we have videos on portable uh, generators, but usually you're going to go for an enclosed inverter. For one, they're going to be quieter for when you're out there camping and boondocking and you don't want to create a ton of noise and annoy everybody around you. And it's gonna give you good, clean power through that inverter. Uh, there's also onboard generators uh, that you can have on your RV. And those are pretty self-explanatory. They provide power for your RV and they're, they're mounted to your RV. Uh, and then there's also inverters, that other line blurring device between uh, the 12 volt side of the DC and the 120 volt AC in the RV. Uh, but we'll talk about the DC side in just a little bit. But all these different options to be able to plug in or different places that you're plugging in your RV into, you wanna have the ability to protect your RV 
from miswired pedestals or different circumstances where you might have over voltage, under voltage, uh, surges coming in there. And that's where the EMS device comes in as an excellent layer of protection. Now we have a whole video on how to protect your RV electrically uh, from EMS device, surge protectors, how to take care of your plugs and cords and uh, all those different things. But if you were gonna ask me for just a, a quick version of that, I would highly recommend everybody having an EMS surge protector. That's a device that you can either plug in or have hardwired into your RV that's gonna let you know if what you're plugging into is wired properly and if there's going to be any problem coming into your RV. It's also actively going to look for any problems, uh, uh, voltage issues or anything that might harm your RV and it'll actively look for those and disconnect you from that power source if a problem arises. Now I get asked a lot what we actually use uh, and our system is definitely overkill and redundant. But uh, we have a portable unit that we can just plug right into the pedestal outside and it's just a surge protector and it gives us some indication of how uh, that is wired, if it's wired properly or if there's a problem from the get-go and we need to ask for a different site. Now I think that sites have either been getting better or we've been going to places that have fewer problems because we've seen fewer pedestals wired improperly. We did find one uh, two weeks ago, it seems like we're coming across them less. Maybe it's because more people are using the surge protectors and letting RV parks know if there's a, a problem with the wiring there. So for our setup, we have this one. Uh, we can test it before we even pull into the site and it gives us a layer of that, that surge protection coming to our RV. And then we have a hardwired EMS device inside of the RV. It's out of sight, out of mind, can't be stolen. And it actively looks for any of those problems and will shut it off before that problem reaches our RV. That is what we use. It's definitely overkill, but I, I recommend getting an EMS device for your RV to be able to protect it. You can check out that video if you wanted to get more of the details diving into that. But one of the big questions that I often get about surge protectors is do I need a 30 amp and a 50 amp depending on when I'm using my adapter? And it's just important to remember, just get one for your RV. If you have a 50 amp RV, get one that is 50 amp. When you plug into that 30 amp, you just use your adapter and then you use your surge protector EMS device that then feeds your RV. If you have a 30 amp RV, get a 30 amp surge protector EMS device and then use your adapter, go to that device that then feeds your RV. So you only need one for your RV. You don't need them for the different situations. That's what the adapters are for and just use your surge protector for your RV. So all that said, the AC side of the RV is actually pretty simple. We plug in our RV to the source, whether that's a generator or a pedestal, and that comes in, depending on if you have an onboard generator, there might be a transfer switch in there, but that line is going to feed the breaker box in the RV. And from there, it gets distributed to the other breakers, which will then go to our end use appliances. So whether that's outlets or microwaves or the, the TV, um, all those things are protected by their individual breakers and the whole system is protected by the main breakers in that panel. And then that's also protected by the pedestal that you're plugging into that should have a breaker that feeds all of this. So. Pretty simple, you plug in the RV and the AC side works. Now that also works the converter, which should be charging and powering the 12 volt side of our RV, which that's what we're going to look at next. Now it's important not to confuse the converter and the inverter. So almost all RVs come with a converter. Uh, so when you plug in your RV, it converts the 120 volts AC and converts it to 12 volt DC uh, that will then charge our batteries and allow us to use everything on that end of the system for the RV. Uh, compared to an inverter, it does the exact opposite. It takes the 12 volt DC out of our batteries and inverts it to be able to use 120 volts AC. So on the, the DC side, uh, this is going to run things like our, our lights, our water pump, uh, electric awnings, our slides, jacks to be able to go up and down, the fans that we have in the RV, uh, the blower on the furnace, all those different devices are functioning on the 12 volt side of our RV. So you can see that we're asking our 12 volt side of the RV to be able to provide power for a lot of these things to be able to function uh, on grid and off grid. So uh, that's where the battery bank comes into play. So we're asking a lot of our converter and for our battery bank for the, the functionality of the RV. 
So one of the big functions you have of your converter is to be able to charge up those batteries. Those batteries is what's gonna be powering that whole 12 volt side when you're not plugged into power. So I often recommend having a converter that's paired well with your battery type. So if you have a lead acid battery bank or an AGM battery bank, uh, having a multi-stage converter being able to charge those properly and more efficiently is going to be a lot more healthy for those batteries and make them last a lot longer. Now, if you have lithium, get a lithium charger for those batteries. Uh, but if you don't know if you have a single stage or a multi stage for your lead acid batteries, uh, just get in there and see if you can find a model number and uh, type that in, see if you can search it. If it has a three stage or a four stage, you're gonna be doing much better than if it's just a single stage converter. Now, I don't wanna dive into all the different battery options, but usually uh, you have lead acid at the bottom that gives you a functionality of your 12 volt side if you're just looking to, to simply power that side and not asking a whole lot out of it. And then you can step up to uh, golf cart batteries, AGM, there's also gel out there, but then uh, all the way up to lithium when you're building a much bigger robust system to be able to, to power an inverter and have a, a, a big setup. So. Uh, there's lots of different reasons why you might choose different batteries, um, but the, the battery 12 volt system is what's going to power uh, the DC side of our RV and allow a lot of these things to function. Now the battery bank is kind of like your fuel tank. How much fuel do you have in the tank? And that's really important to know. For one, on the lead acid side, lead acid AGM and the golf cart batteries, uh, you don't wanna take those beyond 50%. Some people say you can take it to 80% depth of discharge, uh, but if you look at the chart, the deeper you take those each time, the, the fewer cycles you're gonna get out of it. So uh, you can take it lower, but you're just not gonna get as much life out of that battery as you could if you stopped at 50%. So how do you know when you're at 50%? Now that's where the battery monitor comes into play. My opinion, having a good battery monitor is very crucial. Ours just came with a voltage based one, which I think is horrible for being able to tell where your batteries are actually at. It's like the analogy of driving your car. Imagine if you had to drive your car, but you had to let it rest for an hour to be able to tell how much gas is in there. That would be crazy to do on a road trip. How do you know when you're using your vehicle if you have to stop and let it rest? That's kind of what a voltage-based system is like to tell how much power you still have in your batteries. So having a good battery monitor with a shunt is very crucial for knowing how much power you still have in that battery. So when you bring it down to 50%, you know that you're at that 50%. <laughs> So the battery monitor that we installed in our RV is a shunt based system. So basically anything that used to connect to the negative side of the battery gets removed. So we have that on a bus bar on the other side to keep it nice and clean. And then that connects to the load side of the shunt, but on the battery side of the shunt, it's the only thing connected to the battery, the shunt and the battery. It's like a, a gatekeeper. So anything that has to go through the shunt is calculated in and out. And it gives us a very accurate representation of what's in the battery. So very handy to have and very useful for knowing your capacity. So now that we've talked about using power out of the batteries, how do we put some of that power back in? We talked about the converter so that when we're plugged in, that's putting power back into the batteries, but we also have other sources. Uh, onboard generators can be feeding and charging the battery bank. Uh, we can also have solar. We can have the alternator when we're driving. Um, those are different sources that can power or, or put power into that battery bank. So you can use multiple sources to charge your battery at the same time, as long as you don't exceed the charge rate for your specific battery. It's like we use the alternator while we're driving and solar to put power into our batteries while we're driving. We also use the, the converter to put power into the batteries as well as solar at the same time. It's able to do that. So when we did that inverter video a couple of weeks ago, people were asking, well, how does the alternator fit in or how does solar fit in? It just comes in directly to the battery. It doesn't have to pass through that entire system. It doesn't have to go to the inverter and then go to the battery bank. So um, we would connect the negative side for solar and the alternator charging to the shunt. Uh, that's how it's going to get to the negative side of the battery. And on the positive side, it would just go directly to the, the positive side of that battery. So uh, we have multiple ways to be able to charge that battery bank up while we drive, while we're exposed to sun, uh, if we're connected to a generator or we're connected to shore power. Lots of different ways to be able to charge that battery bank so that we can have the power when we need it.
Now, an, an additional device that you have on the class A's, class C's, and the class B's um, is a battery isolator. It'll isolate the batteries between the house batteries and the starter battery. Now, this is important because your alternator can charge both of those battery banks at the same time. But if you're out there using your RV and you deplete your house batteries, you still want your starter battery to be isolated so that you can still start that RV and to be able to drive away. So that way you're not stranded out there. So uh, the motorized RVs will have a battery isolator so that it'll charge both banks at the same time while you drive, but it'll isolate the house batteries for use of the rest of the RV when you're parked and out there camping and you can still start your RV. It's an, it's an important piece of equipment so that you're not stranded. Now we've looked at the different sources of 12 volt to be able to charge our batteries and to be able to bring that 12 volt in. Uh, but as it's distributed, it has to go through a fuse box and that's what's going to protect any of our wires from overcurrent or any of the issues that, that come up. So inside of our RV panel, we have our, our fuse box and we can check those fuses and we can see if any of them have blown. Uh, that's gonna be what's protecting our wires so that we don't have any of those wires melt and create any kind of a fire. Uh, we also have auto resetting breakers throughout the RV. I don't know why they like to hide these in different locations, but um, these are little breakers that will reset uh, if there's a problem or if they overheat or if it needs to protect something. So they'll they'll reset when that condition or problem is fixed, which is, is very handy. So it's just nice to be aware of those. So that way, if you have a problem with one, you could track it down and be able to swap it out. Uh, but we can test those fuses and find any of our problems, uh, but that's how the 12 volt is distributed throughout the RV. Now, one of the last things we're gonna look at on the 12 volt side is the battery disconnect. Uh, you can use this disconnect if you need to work on something on the 12 volt side and you're disconnecting the power. Uh, you can use it when you're putting it into storage. You can disconnect that battery so that uh, nothing's drawing power out of your batteries so that it's not 100% depleted too quickly. Having that battery disconnect will help you from having a draw on those batteries when it's sitting in between trips or sitting in storage. So I think that's gonna do it for today. I hope that this video gives you a good base of the understanding of how RV electrical works, uh, the two different sides, the AC side and the DC side, and how some of those, those systems help each other on both sides. So uh, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you wanna see more videos about RVing, uh, tips, tricks, tutorials, and how-to stuff coming up, hit that subscribe button. And if we don't see you on the road, hopefully we will see you next video. 